I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. And uh, our speaker tonight, and I go back a ways, <laughs> He used to be on the board of Whole Earth Catalog back when and Point Foundation. And uh, we were just swapping stories about 1972 when Whole Earth put some money into taking a bunch of poets and Indians and ne'er do wells and one respectable person, which was Huey, uh, to Stockholm for the UN Conference on the Human Environment, the first one. And we were all, you know, doing parades for whales and uh, making an encampment with a hog farm outside of town where they wouldn't let the hippies into Stockholm. And we had a kind of a sideshow called Life Forum. Well, Huey was there. He was, I guess, Western Regional Director of the Nature Conservancy then. And while we were fussing around being sort of protesty on the side, he got into the big tent and uh, played with the big dogs. Uh, he did that. I was just hearing by uh, waiting until the guards went opposite directions. And then he sprinted and dove over a hedge and broke into the building and knew some of the heavyweights inside who immediately got him past the uh, barrier that the Nixon administration had put up for people like him. That's fairly typical Huey Johnson. Get into where the action is and make stuff happen. Uh, it happened again. I was working with the Brown administration and uh, a couple years in, he wanted a uh, fresh Secretary of Resources. The uh, California Resources Agency is pretty much like the Department of the Interior. <laughs> Damn near as big and uh, certainly as powerful in this very green state. And so I got to make the phone call to Huey Johnson to invite him. Uh, would he mind coming to Sacramento and serving his state as Secretary of Resources? And uh, he modestly accepted, and California was permanently changed by that. I'm particularly interested in hearing what he has to say tonight because while most of my green friends have been going kind of in the activist direction, much as we did in Stockholm, putting on a show over here doing parades and trying to do profound thoughts and stuff, Huey's over with the power guys. Where the money is, where the laws are, where the institutions are, and where the really long-term stuff is. Uh, there's a book of his outside called Green Plans, Blueprint for a Sustainable Earth. And a version of that is what he's talking about tonight, Huey Johnson. Thank you. My subject tonight is the culmination of years of obsession. It seemed to me that um, there had to be a good way or good ways of managing the environment for the good of the earth and humanity. And uh, eventually, uh, after they threw the rascals out of office in Sacramento that time, I wandered around the world looking for what must be a better way. And I actually found it. It's interesting, if we're looking at a 10,000 year clock along now, I think to look back to because particularly in environment, there is a, a chance that things get repeated. And history is that way. And the question about China and Rome, ancient civilizations, the question about China is why were there a number of dynasties instead of one? The answer is, they would have a dynasty booming along just fine until population grew beyond the capability of the land's food to feed it, and then things fell apart internally. Rome, same thing. One of the six reasons that Rome declined was an environmental one. They did a poor job of irrigating their wheat belt in North Africa. It salt built up. They couldn't grow wheat anymore couldn't feed the mobs bread in Rome. They were upset, and that soon became the end of it. And if you look through history, we're going to appreciate that in this country, we ended up in a treasure trove of resources, and we haven't taken much care of them. We observed the decline and had some challenges and problems with it. Uh, the West is littered with ghost towns that were boot mining boom towns and uh, many other 
examples of decline, clear-cut forest from the east, eastern seaboard right through to the west. And about the time of the change of the century, Teddy Roosevelt came along, and he was a great visionary. Uh, he had, uh, rather than going to public school, he had kind of gone on private outings, and his family took him to North Africa, and he was introduced to the Sahara as a young student. And it began to interest him, and he's a naturalist. And uh, he really started a important direction. The philosophy <clears throat> that went along with him up to that point, John Muir started the Sierra Club, inspired a generation and many generations hence. And we then enter the important era of trying to manage things, beginning, we'll say, in the early 1900s. Roosevelt put together the first meeting in history of all the state's governors. It was about the subject of natural resources. Then things continued to progress, and I can remember when we were in Sacramento, uh, air quality wasn't really that big an issue. We knew there was smog, but we were busy doing other things, worrying about energy and water and what have you and all of a sudden you couldn't see. And uh, now we realize that is an unhealthy condition. Uh, mercury alone is responsible for 600,000 babies a year in the United States being affected before birth. And we are facing a condition where China's building a new coal plant every week, it said, and where the Fumes from that drift across the Pacific and come on into California. And so the problems continue to mount. California exists. We are a desert. It exists because we've built dams in all the Sierra canyons, and the water is allowed to trickle out. Water that is from the winter snows, usually, and that could become a problem. The mercury point. This is uh, Minamata, the first um, example of the disease. In this case, a village in Japan uh, getting its water from a stream that was being polluted up, upstream by mercury poisoning. And then we had the important awareness factor of being able to look back at the earth. We thank Stuart Brand for that. Um, he understood the importance of doing it and worked hard and demonstrated and got it done. And that was very important for our thinking. And then <clears throat> we progress. And there are a couple of points I want to make for you that you probably aren't aware of. One is a very valuable asset you have. They are the public lands. Every citizen in this country has more than two acres equivalent in the public lands by stint of being a citizen. And those lands often have very valuable assets on them. Forests, water, grazing lands, timber, mining. Well, you don't know that because the people that are enjoying the profit don't want you to know that. And there, where if a grazing uh, parcel of public lands were uh, a private parcel, you would pay 15 to $25 for what's called an animal unit. That's what it, amount of grass and land it takes for one steer to walk around and eat and grow. And uh, the public lands charge the fellows who have that, have inherited it, most of them, a dollar thirty-five. And so the loss is a taxpayer's problem. The uh, other problems, uh, Recently, there was an interesting expose uh, in the press. The Department of Interior office that manages oil, you saw that. They were caught with uh, drug practices and inter-office sexual practices with oil industry executives and one thing or another. And uh, a bunch of them retired in a hurry. But there is... Uh, a very valuable asset, and it's something you should be aware of. It's a latent political issue. Somebody had to wake up and uh, jar our politicians. 
One problem we have is the politicians benefit. They get, when the guy uh, gets a gift from the public of $14 worth of free grazing, because he only pays $1.30, he's pretty smart and he hires lobbyists and they donate part of that back to the political people and uh, little is said. Diane runs fat and happy on that source. They're Western governors, the guys that are the crudest and roughest in Congress, run happily on that source. Another point of a historic transition was the Abramoff expose recently. This, for the first time, really gave us a clear contemporary look at the problems involved with America's resources. He particularly worked the Department of Interior, the mining lands, the timber lands, and what have you. And uh, there he is embracing our good president. And then we come to the important factor of water again. California, our existence hinges on water. When Stuart and I were in Sacramento in the 70s, we had a drought and got to be pretty sweaty. We ran a pipe over the Richmond Bay Bridge so Marin would have some more water and we'd sit all day while everybody, the city, the mayors would come in and the ag interests would come in and they would grouse away at each other. And uh, in this case, um, 80% of California's water is claimed by agricultural interests. The balance is claimed by cities. This was a portion back just at the turn of the 19th, 1900s, and it was done in a way that there were two uses for all time. It's going to be agriculture or development. Environment didn't get any. That's why one of the key reasons the salmon collapsed recently in the ocean here because they have to come in, go up the streams, you have to have water that's cool enough and deep enough to spawn. Recently, we had a remarkable experience, from my point of view, a investigative reporter, Mike Kerr, um, did this story, and uh, it is immensely important, important enough that uh, we have a award that we would like to give him. I hope he's here. I haven't met him as yet. Is Mike, are you in the audience? Come on up. Good morning. <laughs> One of the uh, examples of his integrity, the prize comes with a thousand dollar check, but he declined the check, saying that he would uh, feel he would risk his reporting integrity, I guess. It's a appearance of conflict of interest. Okay. <laughs> There's that. Would you mind saying a few words for us? You'll get a copy of his, uh, of his story. It's very impressive. Uh, thank you. I, um, I didn't know I was going to be saying anything. Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess I would say that thanks, first of all. Second of all, I think that um, uh, the water is the story in California. Um, it's, it's, it, drives the, the, it drives how California um, uh, exists, its economy, and, and its um, natural resources, and its in limited supply, and there <clears throat> is a uh, a uh, a it's it's become a zero sum game, and it is being fought over. And the next year or two, I think uh, a lot of big decisions are going to be made um, that will that will uh, I think shape the future of California. It's it's an economy and it's a ecosystems. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I might hand it to him. To yeah. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mike. Yeah. Well, you'll have a copy of that article, and it's in-depth, and it's wonderful. It's the first time I've ever seen a successful story like that. The uh, uh, Southern California water interests dominate politics in California, in my view, and um, uh, you'll see why.
This is um, one of the communities that survive and thrive by the water that's pumped 600 miles south from where we gather it up here. The important message that I have been obsessed about all these years, looking for a better way to do it, kind of had a break when a UN commission chaired by a uh, woman, a Dutch, I mean, uh, she was Norwegian, a, a doctor, and uh, a commission to find a better way of managing resources going around the world. And uh, they did a successful job, I think. The message is very much the same. Some of the problems you have as a state trying to retain the quality of its life for all of us is things like time. You can clearly see the dilemma of the time in office <clears throat> compared to the impact. The picture that was on the screen when you arrived was Lake Tahoe and the lowering of Lake Tahoe during a drought period that we have right now. This better way of doing things, called a green plan, I found by going to Norway, and I was really dazzled by what they had in the way of uh, resource management policies and so on. And they said, no, 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 you, you're too easily impressed. You've got to go to the Netherlands. That's where they're doing it right. The, after that period, this model they have, so-called Green Plan, has uh, been involved in a number of other countries. New Zealand, particularly, has a Green Plan. Theirs is a bit different in that they're an agricultural nation, and they export clean, green products. Mexico, uh, has a, uh, Mexico City has a green plan. We took a bunch of Mexican political officials to Holland a few years ago, <clears throat> and uh, that has resulted there. Uh, European Union has adopted the Netherlands example, hired the Dutch specialists who designed that program, and uh, it is doing very well there. And the EU, as a result, is now setting standards for the world on environment. The uh, European Union establishes its laws and regulations for the 500,000 customers that make up the EU, and then they say, and the rest of the world who wants to sell stuff here has to conform to our rules. And thus, Mr. Bush and the boys run into trouble, and uh, even Silicon Valley was warned a few years ago <coughs> that they the European Union was not going to let a lot of electronic equipment into the EU because it had heavy metals that were allowed, not allowed there. And the result was Apple Computer had to withdraw some of its products that it was selling in Europe, for instance. And uh, this is a important example, and it's tragic in another way. The US was the leader in the world, ethically and technically, and uh, we faded in the background. Singapore is a wonderful place to visit, in part because of their green plan. They have uh, probably the best green plan going, but they, traffic is took, no traffic jams, everything's controlled, um, and they have a quality of life that is superior to our own at the present time. <clears throat> there are the main thing a green plan does is manage all the parts of the environment. We traditionally have managed our environment as though we were managing one part of our watch. My watch has 82 parts, but if I only do one part a year, at some point the watch is going to stop running. When I want that watch to keep time, I don't really care about whether one part or another is clean. And you have to keep all the parts working to keep a watch keeping time. Well, we've learned the hard way, you have to do the same thing on managing the environment. And uh, 
these are terms and themes that the Dutch system used and uh, or uses. It's interesting because it also is managing complexity. I've never seen a government able to tackle complexity and make it function successfully and define it and put it together in ways that other people can pick up and copy. And they want you to do that because if global war climate change gets worse, they've taken a third of their landscape from the sea and they could have water over the walls of their dikes and be wet again. So they're very cooperative. Another interesting factor in their approach is that they sit down, business and government went in a room, business approach government in this case. The, uh, it all started when uh, the queen gave a speech in 1988. She's allowed one speech a year, not written by the bureaucracy. The Dutch royalty, it turns out, like all European royalty, learned their lesson from Napoleon, and they don't let the royalty get away with saying a heck of a lot independently. And uh, in this case, the queen said, it's Christmas Eve and I'm setting aside my normal speech where I give Susie an award for taking care of the tulip bulbs and Joe an award for keeping his finger in the dike. And we're going to uh, deal with a very serious problem. Our scientific community has come together. They've done a thorough study of Dutch environmental quality standards. We have the best in the world except there's one problem, they're not good enough. And there's a very real chance that we will have no Dutch great-grandchildren. It was a pretty sour message for Christmas Eve. And uh, the next week, people started meeting. And amid those were a dozen big business leaders. And they sat down and said, you know, hey, we ought to do something. And uh, about that time, they got an invitation from an Eastern European country, newly freed from the Soviet block, and that new freed country wanted to know how to run their affairs in a free enterprise system. They looked at, they have somebody come in and tell them how to, how to run it, and they looked at Germany, and oh, they didn't want to be like Germany, they didn't want to be like the U.S., and so on, and, and, but the Dutch, now there you go, they're successful economically, children are taken care of, good health care, housing, everything. Let's be like the Dutch. So they sent a jet, and the business leaders got on it and went back to this place, and they landed. They got off, and they looked around, and son of a gun, everything was polluted. Streams were dead, children playing in them. Uh, Air quality was terrible. The Soviets had had their heavy industry located there and paid no attention to environmental quality. And they were supposed to stay a week or something, and that night in their hotel, they had dinner, and they said, gentlemen, This is what we thought we wanted. No regulations. You know, we can't help these people. We really, really can't. We better go home and think this out. And they did. They told the host the next day, Jay, we're sorry, we just can't help you. We've got to go home. And they came home and they sat down together and then they went to government and said, we want to propose the most radical move imaginable for us. We want to propose cooperating. For years they had been filing lawsuits the way we do. And, uh, and they were smart enough to say, so let's, we know how to take care of it if you set the standards, but it's going to require some negotiating on our often backward battles over the years on one set of a regulation or another. And the nonprofits were used to sit outside a pack of snarling dogs bitching, saying that they weren't doing good enough, demanding perfection of what was going on inside. And when they progressed, they would pass out whatever their decision was, and the NGOs would look at it and send out a media release, and uh, commending it or criticizing it or whatever. And uh, the business interests pressed government to be darn sure they gave grants to the NGOs, environmental groups, so they would be vigorous and there. And that was critical to the success of the whole plan because the environmental movement was able to threaten those who wanted to leave, any business representatives, and they would really bring pressure on those who didn't want to go in the first place. And that really is what turned things around. One of the things then in managing complexity is to admit, as with a watch, you've got many parts. 
we in the West tend to manage one thing at a time. This year we manage water, next year we'll manage air, then maybe we'll get around to energy. In the meantime, water policy starts falling apart behind us and so on. And the problem we discover is that if you're talking about water policy, you have to talk about energy policy. Because in order to run the pumps to send the water 600 miles down Southern California over a mountain range to boot, you have to burn some fuel to get the electricity. And that pollutes the air. And uh, we always have ignored the connections there. And the connections, of course, are far greater than that. <coughs> In their defining complexity in simple terms, I'm going to run through a few slides to demonstrate that, they have a social contract, they call it, where they understand generally what they're trying to achieve and the public is behind it politically and willing to fund it. They have to have each generation be responsible for recovery during their time and not just passing it on. They started out the very first thing they did was list these eight points, and they became the premise of what they were going to build on. An interesting one is no waste export. That means nothing leaves Holland that's manufactured there. If you've got bricks, you don't send them to some poor country in Africa. You get rid of them in Holland. Another thing they did uh, was be honest about the impact of their programs and their efforts. And they went right out to the global when they were doing any of their planning. These are some of the challenges that they really started focusing on, realizing they probably could have an effect on, actually. And these were points that they focused to manage of all the problems they had, they decided they had to correct these first as they started out down the road of total recovery in 25 years was their goal. At, at every level, salmon back in the Rhine, transportation problems taken care of, health problems taken care of, the works. And they're doing it. They're about in their 20th year now. Squandering is wasting resources. You know, putting an extra layer of tin on a tin can when you could get by with one. They would, they would believe that you don't need to use the quantity of resources that we use in society. And they've been very effective at that. It's interesting, there's a side story with that. I'd go back. The reason this worked, another reason it worked pretty well was luck, but they had a minister of environment who was the head executive in this large consulting firm called McKinsey, American consulting firm, well, it's all over the world. And the guy in Holland was conservative and grumpy, and he said, damn government, he said, I'm gonna run for office, and he ran for office, and the next thing he knew, he was the, the minister of environment, and he didn't know anything about the subject. And some young people in, in these Dutch agencies had been dreaming for a chance to carry out an idea they had, so they came to him, they said, Mr. Minister, here's our idea. And we think if you'll follow it, Holland will be an example for the world. And they had 82 things to be managed that would return environmental quality in Holland. And this guy who's an expert made a million dollars a year or better, as a salary working for them, said, well, tell you what, he said, if I were advising General Motors, I wouldn't let them have more than five points because a human mind can't handle all the intricacies of interrelationships of more than but a few points. It can't manage something that gets too big. And he said, so you guys go back, and uh, you come in with five, and I'll do it. And they came back, and they, they stuck on eight, he finally. But he said, where in hell did you get those 82 points? And he said, oh, we got it from the US EPA. That's what they're following. Interesting experiments that have been very successful for them. 
uh, the idea of green taxes. They get about 15% of their tax take each year now from green taxes. And it's really neat to visit there because these things are prominent. Uh, the kind of bottom line for them, they came up with this term several years ago, they normally they saw economic growth and the problems from industrialization, pollution, and what have you growing with it. And what they decided they could do was to have the economy grow, but the problems to drop. And that's this design. The, uh, you can see, I think, the, uh, that's the economic growth. And this is solid waste. They've taken, taken care of solid waste. It's no longer a relevant problem to them, for instance. And they put a lot of beauty and philosophy into their stuff. And in order to get things going, they went to the right place. They went to the U.S. and bought two U.S. public relations firms over to Holland to put together a campaign for them to get this thing sold and maintained by the public. And another thing they do is print everything in English. And they're much like the Germans. It's as though they've been assigned the task of building a better Mercedes than the Germans. And they do a book on the tires, and they do a book on the steering mechanism, and a book on the seats. You go face down in your soup real quick, trying to keep up with all the printed stuff that comes out from them. I've tried diligently, and uh, it's a challenge. I actually went face down in my soup once. I was over there, and I, it was a wonderful guy from Wisconsin named Gaylord Nelson. He was a senator. And Gaylord had invited me to be his guest at some award banquet where he was getting an award. And it just happened that I could take a plane from Amsterdam to Milwaukee or wherever I did. And gee, I was in that. They had cocktails beforehand. He was very handy with the pouring drinks and playing poker. That's how I got to know him. And uh, playing poker all night in the Wisconsin woods. And um, so anyway, I tottered to my place at the speaker's table. And damn, I was tired. I kept just biting my lip trying to stay awake. The next thing I knew, I was asleep. And he was very generous and joking about it for a long time to come. <laughs> Another fascinating uh, success. Uh, New Zealand uh, just tore up all, a lot of their laws and... Uh, uh, restructured their government around managing resources. And in that case, they had a uh, long debate in their parliament, and finally, at about midnight, they got in no place after many days, and one grumpy old senator said, damn it, I've had it. This is all I'm put, time I'm putting in on this subject. He said, we've ruined our year. And he said, you guys are just trying to put together a grab bag for all the social problems in New Zealand, and I'm not going to buy it. And they said, well, what would you buy, Senator? And he said, what you want to do is manage this stuff more effectively from what you've been talking about. And they said, yeah. And he said, well, this calls a management act, and we'll vote it as such. And they did. And uh, it really is successful and uh, has turned around their country's approach to managing resources and enhancing the quality of their citizens' lives, which is much of what government ought to be about. Each of these topics, of course, has a chapter. I have a book out there, and it's one of many that's available on the subject. They practice good management again. They delegated from their central government definition what they're going to do right down to local and city councils. And those are working very well. We've had a problem. <laughs> but that problem is about to end, thank goodness. And at least Mr. Obama's team has this particular collection of things, and they're studying it, we hope. Then suddenly, about the time 
I started to relax a little bit, here came climate change. And last summer, an example of that, we had, what, a thousand forest fires all happening in one day. We couldn't even get enough people together to fight them. And it, you have to be in a forest fire to appreciate the terror of it. I, one role I had there in Sacramento was responsible for, for fires or floods or something or other. And uh, if the state and federal governments were going to work together on a problem, I had to sign off on it. And one day, uh, they'd call me, and there was fires happening in Southern California. A plane picked me up at the airport, and, and Marin, and uh, flew us down. And they put us in a fire truck and uh, went roaring down the highway that was closed because of the fire. And uh, we, these guys were very macho firefighters. They were showing off, of course, but damn, the flames were belching over the road 100 feet in the air. It was just like any Im imagined hell. And we came to a spot, they were to a stop, and we looked off the edge. And there, down a canyon, was the wind with creating a blowtorch effect. A wall of fire as high as the ceiling, just screaming. And there were 300 houses down there that were being torched by that. And um, boy, I'll tell you, it's that kind of thing, and floods the same. But nature bats last, and uh, we tend to get carried away sometimes with our ability to control things. But as we learned in New Orleans and other places, we haven't quite gotten there yet. And right now, California faces this problem of drought and water problems, and we have the worst water laws of any state in the nation. And they're purposely kept that way by those guys in Southern California that managed to that article uh, that Mike wrote notes that they, one water district, the Kern Water District, long time problem water district in my view, uh, managed to take off with $100 million of a water bond issue. And that's what the article is about and what his research is about. First time, that goes on a lot, but that's the first time I know of that it's ever been documented and still isn't being paid much attention to. Well, we get to a good part. <clears throat> California had the luck of having a governor and a legislature that cared. A woman named Fran Pavley was an assemblywoman, now running for the Senate, and she carried this bill, AB 32. And this AB 32 is as good as anything going on in Europe or any place in the world, if it were passed and operated as it could be. It's a very important moment for this thing because October gets your, your last view. Today was a deadline for commenting on air quality as part of it. The administration skipped today as deadline, but um, the special interests are maneuvering like mad, trying to weaken it. And I think it's the most important legislation that's passed in a century. And a lot of it will if it's carried out, will enhance the quality of your lives, and if you have any grandchildren, guarantee they'll have a place to live too. These things take years to put together because there's so many in, in rooted interests that you have to bring around, work out, and so on. It, did. it took five years in the Dutch case, and about four years in New Zealand's case, of ardent work on those issues to uh, get them in definable shape. That 12% I will add came pretty much from the Jerry Brown administration's days in Sacramento. That was a goal we had been a while. So there are a lot of factors involved with this AB 32. And uh, we're going to actually hand you a piece of paper with an address to, to be in touch with to comment on this idea and why, what you think about it or if you think it's important. 
Normally, we've only passed bills to deal with one resource. A hundred bills, several thousand bills are introduced every year in Sacramento, for instance. And for really the first time, we've woven them together in a comprehensive, very important recovery plan for the vitality of the state. But, as you might expect, there are some flaws, and one that you might write about, if you go all through this thing, there's just sick as heck and fine print and whatever, you get to the point you realize, well, where's water? Water is ignored in the thing. It has one point, it says, well, we should charge $50 to hook up water fee to hook up to a new building. That's it. So one thing you could do is say, for God's sake, Governor, let's shape up and correct your, your water problems and include, you can't really have environmental management if you're not managing your water in a desert state. The only place where the state mascot is found. We have an office here at Fort Mason, the Resource Renewal Institute, and be glad to answer any questions in the future that you might have. And uh, an additional point I would add, exciting to me, for years I felt, when I grew up as a child, I grew up in northern Michigan, and a great thing to do was go ice fishing. So I bugged a friend of mine over the years who has a travel agency saying, I'd like to go ice fishing on Lake Baikal in Siberia. And uh, he agreed, and I'm going to lead a trip in March if anybody wants to go. <laughs> Just got the news. Thank you. Thank you. Let me pull us back up. Huey, another title for this talk that I saw you use to some of your mailing lists was basically long-term green planning. And one of your diagrams showed the difference between uh, the time of environmental impacts and the time uh, that office holders <laughs> in yeah. government right. typically uh, yeah, problem. are in place. And you were, so I'd love to get a little bit of the, these are all Californians here, and a lot of Californians will watch the video. A little bit of sense of the continuity. You had, what, six years as Secretary of Resources? Yeah, right. Five Tell minutes. me a little bit about the stuff that you and Jerry Brown and everybody in the administration <coughs> was able to put in place, and then what happened to that, and sort of what's the trend line over time of the kind of stuff you guys did yeah. then? Um, well, we started out with a, what might today be called a primitive form of green plan, and uh, I put together a 100-year plan for the future of California, first of all. and. Uh, went to the Republican Party and said, this is what I want to do. I want to start managing these resources together comprehensively and doing a better job than we've done in the past. And they laughed at me and said, you know, you're so controversial, there's no way you'll even get this thing printed up. <laughs> Republicans will block it. And I said, all right. They said, in fact, we'll bet you a dinner you won't be able to get it accepted. And so I said, all right. And we backed off, and I went and sat there and mused with my friends, and we thought, well, we've got to get some industrial leaders. And somebody knew somebody that knew somebody inside IBM at a high level. And before long, I was sitting down with a guy in charge of IBM in the West. I told him what I wanted to do. He said, it makes sense. Good for the economy, good for the employees. I said, can I use your lobbyist? He said, help yourself. <laughs> then uh, I went to the Bank of America and got the same response. Southern Pacific Railroad and several others. And then when I went back, I flashed my roll like a gambler. And those guys said, oh, God. So we got it passed. And uh, we were able to get, um, I think it was $120 million a year from offshore oil revenues to run it. And much of it is still in place and still running. Um, there are tricks to the trade of keeping things in government. There's a term putting tracks in stone. Mm -hmm. And if you get a bureaucracy that's sold on an idea and they love it and it provides them employment and it makes them feel good, they're not going to let that thing disappear. And they, people will try to make it disappear, but suddenly somebody will lose a letter. It's got to be signed that day and it never got there and nobody knows anything. 
So a lot of things continue. Do you have examples of that from, from what happened? Like Duke, Duke Magian came in after Jerry Brown yeah. moved on, and then what happened? And well, how, did, how did the things you baked in actually persist through that? Uh, a quick story about Duke Magian. Uh, I, on a public land issue, wanted to sue the federal government because they had been dishonest in rigging statistics on wilderness legislation in California. They were, they were gonna turn loose all our wild lands and let it be logged. And uh, Duke Majin and I weren't the best of friends at that time. And uh, he would pass me in the hall. He might say, oh, you son of a bitch. And I would say, oh, you bastard, or whatever it was. <laughs> it's pretty intense. So he wasn't friendly. And uh, I learned that I had to get him to sign the complaint. The Attorney General of the state has to sign the complaint if you're going to sue the federal government. How in the world was I going to do that with his attitude? Well, I let it be known I wanted to have it done, and uh, one of his secretaries was an ardent environmentalist, <laughs> and uh, she studied him well and said, well, he comes in the morning before he reads the paper, and he signs about He's got a stack, he signs about 12 things he reads, and then he gets hurried and distracted, and he just signs them all. <laughs> we sued and we won. <laughs> that worked well. So that was an example of uh, the system. If you've got it on your side, it really works pretty well. Play hard, play dirty. That's the <laughs> lesson, right? Uh, that's a little bit dependent on the personality, uh, the, you know, how do you, I mean, you, you mentioned getting the, the, the staffs of the departments engaged with these things. But what else do you do to manage this kind of continuity? Because <clears throat> there's no hope if, 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 if everything switches when the pendulum goes back and forth. Yeah. That's, that's part of how a, you know, a two-party democracy works. It goes back and forth. That's right. And it acts like an eraser. So how do you overcome <laughs> that? Well, it doesn't act like an eraser because it is in place with the British parliamentary system on through ours and others. Once they've debated intensely in the legislative process and it somehow or other has gotten to be law and it is on the books and it's functioning, it's pretty hard. You can come in and you can spend some time and you can erase some things. I mean, I got in the office the first day I announced I was gonna oppose uh, nuclear energy. <laughs> and uh, boy, that bought down the house and uh, I just went looking for guys that were nuclear engineers that had been planted by the industry in our state agencies, and I got them fired. <laughs> <laughs> Took care of it. <laughs> and they probably never got back, so you're right on that. <laughs> no. uh, actually, got no one question us. here without a name on it, uh, again, on California politics. What is your opinion of California Proposition 10 that requires more use of renewable energy by utility companies? I think anything like that that we can do we should do. And uh, the utilities in California have really been pretty good. We passed some early legislation that required that they uh, improve over what they had in the past. And uh, so over a period of years, they've ranked well up on top of utilities in the states and the nation. And uh, so anything we can do to uh, keep them improving, we should. And they'll always oppose new ballot issues. They'll hire lobbyists and try and block everything that is proposed. But once it's in place, as long as it's what's called a level playing field, if everybody has to live by that rule, they don't mind. They'll bitch about it, but they don't mind. And uh, the thing you've got to do is be darn sure what the ballot issues are. Prop 7 is coming on now. Uh, What's his name, the guy from Texas? Is Pickett, yeah. is bankrolling that, mm -hmm. which will benefit his business and his friends. And uh, it'll be dressed up, but that one we ought to beat. But a lot of this stuff is... That one we ought to be what, not doing or doing? Not doing, yeah. Okay, but 10 you like? Yeah. All right. Uh, here's a nice systemic question from David Weckler. Where's Weckler? Right here. The examples of governments with green plans that you gave have relatively small populations, except maybe the European Union, which is <coughs> just getting started. So what do we know about complexity of natural systems that might shed light on what we will have to do to manage them at the larger scale, especially global scale, given climate change? How do these things scale? 
I mean, you know, you had devolution there in New yeah. Zealand. You know, they've worked it down to the local cities and regions and so on. But we're talking big. big. It's bigger yeah. in California. It's a good well, if you look at, don't see the EU as small. It's mm -hmm. twice the size of the U.S. 500,000 citizens that are buying things and demanding. Million. Pardon? Million. 500 million. I'm sorry. Right, thank Give you. Give or take. Yeah. <laughs> 500 million, okay. And that's a huge market. And uh, they've got 27 nations. And they are an example of a phenomenon to me of having been able to work out their fiscal policies so they, they can share a euro. And they have lived on wars there for centuries where they would disagree over little things constantly. Well, rather than having a third world war, they've turned the EU into a working, successful example of managing complexity. And um, when you get out in the world, I'm not, I don't really have an answer since we haven't gotten there yet. I would certainly uh, try and put together a new agency, a world agency. The UN has had some wonderful successes, hmm. and uh, they're limited. But if you're facing certain disasters, say on climate change, I am somewhat optimistic that we will come together and deal with it. Wait, what, what would be a model of this kind of global entity? And is this you know, WTO or what? It, besides the UN, what the hell is there to say, we'll do it like that, only green? Yeah. Uh, I haven't struggled with that question. Okay. To be honest. Someone here, please. I should. It. We're it's going to have a conference on October 16th, uh, the day before the Bioneers Conference. It's part of the Bioneers Conference in Marin. And we're bringing over some of the original thinkers who put together the Dutch Green Plan and the New Zealand Green Plan. Hmm. And um, they will be there answering questions and speaking uh, on the 16th all day. Well, we're thinking about national things these days because we have a, a, a presidential election going on. So Kevin Kelly's question is, uh, adhering to your principle of keeping the challenges few, what one function would do the most good on the U.S. national scale about now? Instead of 82, and then instead of, you can do five maybe, but actually start with one. Well, I, the most important one would be water management. You can get, you can get by with half the energy we're using, mm -hmm. and uh, when water starts disappearing, civilizations have historically declined, and we really face that. And uh, we were close to reverse migration in the last drought when Stuart and I were in Sacramento, and it was a sweaty time. Papers didn't talk about it, but it was there. We now face another potential problem like that, and we're not ready for it. Our laws are played with and manipulated by particularly these traditional water interests. So you want to change the pricing structure or what? I would change uh, certainly the pricing structure, the uh, health aspects, the uh, process for um, delivering, and, uh, and all the technical processes that would consume energy, cleaning water, moving water, that would allow it to be reused. Uh, water really isn't a, ultimately in that short of supply if we apply some of the tactics that we can apply to make it reusable instead of just using it once and then pouring it in the ocean. We put enough water in the ocean every day in Los Angeles to irrigate 125,000 acres so it could easily be used and is being used in progressive places. Another uh, presidential campaign question. You're a fisherman and a hunter, and the world wants to know, what is moose hunting really like? <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw her with a caribou down, and that's very close to shooting a Chevrolet truck in a used truck lot. You know, <laughs> there isn't much to it, and uh, it's kind of embarrassing. I did it once, and that was a delicious caribou, but I'm not going to do it again. It's a... Uh, 
not much sport or ever involved. And with a moose, what do you do once you've killed the moose? Yeah. <laughs> well, the moose always wins because uh, <laughs> they're so big, you can't turn them over. You've got to clean whatever you get. And I'm an ardent elk hunter. And I've noticed as I aged uh, a year ago, another fellow and I both had the good fortune or misfortune to get an elk at the same time. And they were close together. And we walked up to the elk and, gee whiz, we couldn't even, we were wrestling him, trying to get him over so we could start cleaning them. And then you've got to do all kinds of things with them to get them skinned and ready to cut up and so on. And boy, you had a several long days work by the time you do that. And then moose are far worse. And the worst thing you can do is have to take it out on your back, mm -hmm. which I've done with elk. And you take it 60 pounds at a time. And it's usually uphill in the snow. And uh, <laughs> it's not much for a city boy. I hear the word in Alaska is never shoot a moose more than a mile away from the road. <laughs> no, not even that far away. <laughs> no, be... Here's a question from Anonymous. Where are you, Anonymous? Once upon a time, it was rumored that Mr. Johnson and Mr. Brand had a falling out over nuclear power. Do strong egos provide leadership and or hinder cooperation? <laughs> <laughs> I would say <clears throat> you always should be able to disagree with your friends. And I have a habit of being very intense in my disagreements, and they range far and wide. And uh, I can't say I've ever really lost a friend permanently yet, though I probably should have. And we're still friends, as you can tell. Oh, sorry, uh, I like nuclear power for green reasons, and Huey dislikes nuclear power for green reasons. I uh, got a well, I was Is concerned about it because of the years in Sacramento, mm -hmm. and uh, happened to meet some Russian scientists who were over here campaigning after Chernobyl against mm -hmm. our ever tackling nuclear, and I got to know them well, and they invited me to, went over to Moscow twice and spoke to the Russian Academy of Sciences about it, and debated it some, and uh, I've only been, s the uh, Russian scientists were wonderfully courageous men who had looked the Soviets in the eye and said, no, God damn it, we don't want any more, and they risked their lives and careers, um, and they have published several hundred papers now opposing nuclear and reasons why. They've, the, they're the groups that have been studying downwind of Chernobyl and everything is polluted. You can't burn the firewood, you can't grow vegetables. Um, it's really a mess, and human factors, health-wise and otherwise. So. Biggest wildlife uh, area in the <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Europe now is, of course, around Chernobyl. Yeah. Same thing as the DMZ in, in Korea, whatever. And, you know, th there's actually, you know, who really loves uh, radiation for this kind of purpose is Jim Lovelock. He says, look, if you want to protect a forest, just release some radiation in there. The people won't go in. <laughs> That's right. The animals don't get, give a damn. I never thought about that. <laughs> there you'll be. It's a good idea. <laughs> I changed my direction. A uh, question from Carol Di Benedetto for you, right here. Uh, do you think the four, can't be trillion, large amount of money uh, Google plan may help keep the U.S. back on uh, track toward an integrated green plan. Are you tracking on what Google.org is up to? I read about it in the paper. I don't know anybody in Google, and uh, I would love to, and I'd love to get a nice grant from them to go tearing off after one thing or another, but so would everybody else. And uh, well, I would hope pitch, so. Uh, what happens when money comes into uh, to your operation? We're a small operation with an office here, and we would set up a project hire some employees, uh, define what should be done on that particular project, and start it out. We often look for ideas. It Examples could be of that, where a certain amount of money made a certain thing happen? Yeah, there's a, a, a thing called the Grand Canyon Trust. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it up here in Greens over lunch and uh, determined that we would uh, do well to use the Grand Canyon as a flagship for the world's parks, that uh, that would be important to do. And so we put an organization together from this office and uh, established it. I was on the board a year and then I resigned. And the organization has gone on to do that work and they've got offices now in Washington, Utah, Arizona, and are doing very well. So that's an example of our 
attempting to take an idea, put it in an institutional form. How much of this kind of stuff works well at the city level? I mean, uh, Portland, San Francisco are taking a lot yeah. of bows for being green municipalities. Is that true, and how can they be better? Uh, I again would turn toward European EU examples, mm -hmm. where Copenhagen and Amsterdam and The Hague and many other places really are remarkable in their progress, in their concern, in their management of environmental quality. And um, the, a city can be managed very well, um, maybe easier than some of the expansive landscapes that we try to manage. Why? It's comprehensive and uh, you've got more people to deal with the problem, people to pick up trash, people to uh, debate and understand and support or dis disagree with politicians and to bring pressure on the, on the powers that be to bring about change. I think San Francisco seems to do that pretty well with the mayor and his vegetable gardens and solar programs. Um, What's the ideal interaction between the city and the region or the city and the countries of the rural, the rural urban yeah. thing? How's that work out best? The ones I know about, um, I think uh, Portland, Oregon has a regional form of government mm -hmm. and it really works. It's effective and so they have central city and then all the outlying cities and uh, they have policies in place. They're continually improving them and uh, it's every city planner's dream to have regional city approaches. Uh, that's the only one I'm aware of in the U.S. that works that way. Remember Larry Peterson from Sacramento? Vaguely. He was, he's a teacher city planning in Florida. And he has to go down as well. There's Still. a region, one big watershed. Pam Strayer, where are you? Back there. What can we expect from a new administration in uh, 2009? basically do two things, and you're probably tracking on this, uh, what you think will happen, assuming, say, Obama wins, and uh, then going forward, assuming they'll do whatever they come in with, and then what should happen? Well, the first thing that happens is the special interests will be first in line. They will be there manipulating and pressuring and being damn sure their base is covered if they can. And the appointments to these federal agencies, like the Department of Interior, it oversees this two acres that each of you own. Um, these guys will want to make sure that doesn't change. They want to get the gold free out of the ground, which they do now. They don't pay a royalty. Um, the Mining Act is passed in something like 1867, and it's never been changed. Mm -hmm. And you get a f free ride if you mine gold on the public land. And they'll try to keep things like that in place. They'll try to keep uh, water management in place. There's a so lot is of that a revenue issue? Is there a way that uh, the government could pay its bills better if it revised all that? It sure would. But right now, those guys are, the special interests are smart enough, and the election laws are so sad as regards funding mm -hmm. that they get all this water free, as I mentioned, the 100 million that Kern Water District, is, uh, Mike wrote about, and you can bet a good hunk of that goes back into politicians' campaigns so the rules don't change, so they can keep doing things like that. They've been doing it for 100 years. They're not going to change if they can help it. So that, those forces really start moving in on the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, whoever's in office, and uh, contributions are bundled and given. Probably the most challenging environmental law change we have is campaign finance reform. Hmm. Because you can, the key to political problem is a committee in Congress controls legislation that's going to be introduced. Say there's a um, seven member majority, well all you have to do is buy four or five of those guys so that you can never get a majority against your issue if you're an oil company. So the legislation never gets out of the committee, it can be introduced till and uh, so the, the ease with which one can affect politicians with contributions is a snap. Parliamentary system in, in Europe or these other places, by comparison, I like because they limit the time you're going to run something like eight weeks, and they limit the funding, and there's no 
ability there to control committees by bribing anybody. And uh, it's healthier in that regard. Were you involved a couple of years ago in sort of getting the Green Party going in this country? I attempted to mm -hmm. and uh, kind of withdrew from it. it it became, uh, <clears throat> as often happens in politics, if you have an idea and it starts to look like it's successful, we all have some dream in our pocket that we'd like to see enacted as working policy for the nation. And if we see a wagon coming down the road that's got making headway, damn, we will paint ours green and jump on. And uh, the Green Party soon had so many attachments and layers and social dreams that it obviously wasn't going to go anyplace. So. I remember uh, Ralph Nader became the Green Party uh, candidate yeah, right. for president. He's still running. Uh, yeah. What was your opinion of that? Well, it was courageous. And uh, <coughs> he knew he wasn't going to win. And uh, I'm glad he did. And of course, I'm happy he did because of the resulting effect on Mr. Gore. Was that one of them where... Um, Wait, you wanted Gore not to win because... No, I wanted Gore to win, but I mean, this, as I recall, there was a lot of dissent because he peeled off enough of the liberal vote mm -hmm. that the close election went against the Democrats. Now, as I remember, you said that you, when he became the candidate, you called Ralph Nader and decided he didn't know how to spell the word environment. And, <laughs> yeah, I didn't uh, support him. <laughs> And then uh, called That's the right. Green Party guys and said you were resigning. <clears throat> Is that how you remember it? I don't remember it that clearly, but something like that. <laughs> Just say. <laughs> he has to be diplomatic. <laughs> no, I don't really. <laughs> Got some more questions. Uh, go ahead and stand up with one if you got it. Uh, which one? Um, remind me. Well, I, it's about awkward drilling in California and what you expect to happen there. Great. Go ahead. What do you think of the uh, <laughs> drill baby drill? Yeah, really. Well, I obviously oppose it uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which it would be 10 years before you had a drop of oil out of the process. And uh, the other is we could right now not be importing foreign oil if we just enacted what Jerry Brown's administration started when he was there, of energy conservation as a first priority. And the oil interests are so damn powerful that they can just manipulate and uh, change things. Yes, sir. So I, I was a bit surprised when you said your, your top initiative would be in the area of water. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Could others hear that question? Basically, is, is uh, he, Garrett Gruner, is, uh, who ran for governor a while back, um, was surprised that Huey was focusing on water and wonders if maybe a carbon tax that would be more of the essence. Is that about right? Well, I think uh, carbon tax, per se, or it's a dis discussion about carbon so much, is a panacea. It's a part of the problem, and we've made it the big thing because fossil fuel interests and others can make a profit from it. And it doesn't really make that much sense. Cap and trade, cap and tirade in my view. I think that there should be a green tax and uh, the Dutch example. Um, Say a little bit of how the green tax works. Well, it's in, they use the term green tax um, and, it, and apply it in different ways. They might put a, uh, an extra dump fee that would uh, help cover the cost of something else. An extra fee on uh, fuel at the pump years ago. Anybody who's been in Europe and filled a car, I remember I had a little Volkswagen, the doggone gas tank was $75 10 years ago. And uh, that $75 was to build a new bicycle lanes. The public was delighted with it. Hmm. And uh, uh, in fact, one of our colleagues on uh, Point board, what was his name? Bruce Cates. Bruce Cates, right? Was over there in a huge sailboat. <laughs> he invited me to be his guest while I was working in Holland, and I did. And uh, he had a couple of bicycles, and we went whizzing off across Highland. Gee, that was a, a 
Holland. It was a wonderful experience at that time, being his guest. How about uh, mass transit? Are you all for a fast train to LA? I'm sure for a fast train to LA. I'm in favor of it. The first attempt was to go down the coast, then we're going to go from State Park to State Park. And uh, I opposed that vigorously, and uh, they now are going to go over the hill the other way, down the valley. I think that's a good thing. I really love trains. I'm sure you do, and we all do. Mm -hmm. Being on a bullet train in Japan is a nifty experience. Question in the back there. Uh, what do you think of environmental education in the public schools? <laughs> <laughs> well, I really was passionately for it when I got out of college and uh, still am. However, it just uh, was outmaneuvered politically. It didn't have any champions who knew what they were doing. And soon it was swept aside by the latest gym exercises or more mathematics or whatever it is in the popularity contest that represents curriculum planning and education in the U.S. Do we get a sense that, um, I remember this, your relation with the point board and when we were in Stockholm and so on, you were always a, a kind of harsh realist amongst all these idealistic uh, greenies that uh, I was hanging out with. And basically uh, telling the ideologues to grow up and get realistic and practical and pragmatic and uh, get down and dirty with the politics and make stuff happen. Is that still your advice? I would say probably it was a bit brash. Um, he was known in our group as the thug <laughs> for good. Thank <laughs> God he's right. on our side. We he said. gave me a, that often shows up to this day. <laughs> I know. Thug for good. Uh, no, I would, it is very important to have passionate people making their case in a free society for whatever they believe in. And I, I didn't have that, but I have some photographs of the Dutch program with people demonstrating. You know, kids marching down the street with flags and so on, demanding that uh, more be done. In fact, a, a quick story about that. Um, I happened to be over there once and there was to be the first meeting of a huge new youth group in Holland, an environmental group. And what had happened is a couple of recent college graduates thought, hell, we'll just go out and sign up all the nonprofit groups in Holland and call it an organization. And then we'll have a conference and we'll terrify the government. So they did. And the big university, they had the largest auditorium in Holland and standing room only. And there on stage were these two guys, students, who started this thing. And it was big enough that they had 30, 350,000 members that they waved around. And on stage with them was the head minister of finance for the government of Holland, and uh, in a suit and vest and sweating, and uh, another one of their highest officials. And these kids marched up and down and, and looked at them and browbeat them and said, you know, you guys have driven us in the hole. Holland is in debt, and now you want to retire and be fat and happy and leave it up to us to pay off all the damages you've created. And they said, we don't like that. And we want you to get serious. You're running government now. We want you to clean the damn environment up. We want you to start spending $5 billion more than you're spending as of Monday morning, or we're going to vote you guys out of office. And these guys were and geez, we don't have that kind of authority, you know, we can. But the result was they compromised, and that youth group got an official recognition that nations get. So that the minister gets to sit down once a month with the prime minister to talk about relationships. Now, were you saying earlier that the Dutch government gives money to these NGOs yeah. to, to uh, be such a pain in the ass? Yeah, and they'll sue the government too with that money. I mean, they, they really, well, the Dutch are neat that way. You know, they've got good drug laws, the uh, earliest child labor laws, things that we, I mean, you can walk up and down the streets and the alleys and the pot shops are kind of fun. Um, how is that not corrupting? I mean, here's, <coughs> I'm a greenie and I'm getting, how much of the money of my organization will be coming from the government? It's tempting to be very corrupting. Okay, but well how much am I getting from the government? I would say probably, if you're active in that thing, a third. 
Okay. And uh, there's every reason that whoever's handling the money, flies come to money the way they do manure. And uh, you can bet that there will be problems with that. But it isn't going to be a permanent condition. And it has worked to the point that those environmentalists didn't have to get a job someplace else. They sat outside those doors and they sent out their press releases and they cheered or, or moaned, depending, and helped make that Dutch plan a success. And the business leaders <clears throat> who were inside said of all the things that made their program go, it was the threat of the environmentalists outside the door that kept them all working inside. Because that thing would have disintegrated in seconds a number of times. It hadn't been there. So I think I've seen the importance of citizen's voice mm -hmm dissent uh, a lot since I made whatever statement that was back then. But the way you tell the story, it, the, the change came when the business people decided a change needed to happen. And they basically, then you had the triad of government, NGOs, and business point in the same direction rather than at each other. Yeah. Say a little more about how that happens, how that might happen here, or is it already happening here, and what does one help happen further? Uh, what's the structure of that one? It was, uh, it happened, as I mentioned, because of the experience, the, the Queen's speech, and going over to the Eastern Bloc country. The Queen. We forgot the Queen. We need a Queen. Yeah, that's it. Well, we I know we'll one have who a would like hunter to. if things go bad. <laughs> Hillary. Yeah, we <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right. Um, and a lot of things, are, large U.S. firms are doing business in Europe. They understand clearly what's happening there, and they work well with it. When they come back here, they just act like they, you know, no rules. And uh, it's our fault as citizens that we let them get away with that. Um, if an administration was in office that wasn't vulnerable to big contributions, they would come to the table themselves and say, hey, let's... In fact, they will anyway. With the mm -hmm. EU setting world environmental standards, the U.S. has to get in shape and conform to that kind of behavior in order to go out and be successful competing in the world. If you make something and you send it over to the EU, and the EU says, I'm sorry, it's got pollutants in it, take it back. <clears throat> That's happening. <clears throat> our beef industry uh, punches so much hormones in our beef that the EU won't let it be bought in over there. This has been going on for years. There's some beef gets in, but very little. And we just stubbornly say, well, hell with it. You're going to buy our beef or else, or else what? Well, we're not selling our beef. And so they are getting to be a very strong international voice, and their behavior is such that other countries are following suit. And we have fallen behind thinking we might not have to. We're used to being the tough guy in the neighborhood. We're not any longer. How about Asia? Is Singapore a leader in that respect, or, or uh, just an interesting local city-state doing something uh, amusing <laughs> but irrelevant? They're um, it's kind of an enigma, all right? They're a city-state. I went over there probably 40 years ago, my first time through, and uh, boy, it was dangerous. You've seen a lot around. of change in 40 years. Yeah, that's right. and. Uh, I remember one thing, some guy grabbed my billfold, pickpocket in an alley, and I had it on a chain, and I ended up wrestling him <laughs> in the dirt and getting my billfold back. <laughs> well, now you could lay on a park bench in Singapore with your billfold on your chest, take a nap, and nobody would touch it. And uh, that's happened. You've read in the paper about how severe their laws can be. They had a, uh, their first prime minister was a really a green guy. Mm -hmm. And he got in office, and he said, well, I want to do certain things, A, B, and C. And he said to one of his aides, I want you to be in charge of cleaning up rivers. And uh, the hotel where Hemingway and the boys uh, is still there. It's a beautiful, beautiful hotel now. Then the wall, wallpaper was peeling off the walls, and a beer was a 50 cents or something. Now a beer is $10, and it's marble. <laughs> and... Uh, he told this guy, tell you what, son, I want that river cleaned up, and if you clean it up, I'm going to give you a gold medal. Hmm. And uh, the guy cleaned it up. He didn't say what he wasn't going to do, but uh, this guy was pretty tough. And uh, This keeps happening. That was Lee Kuan Yew, presumably. Yeah, right. All that happened. Yeah. And, you know, we had Haiti 
right next to this, the Dominican Republic story that's told in Jared Diamond's uh, collapse book. And Haiti's gone steadily downhill, and there was a dictator in the Dominican yeah. Republic who, for reasons unknown, was a greenie. And when you fly over to the island now, one half is green and the other half isn't because this dictator just said, you're going to be green, get used to it. So is that what it takes? Is it takes uh, the benign dictator here? Well, I think it takes a leader. Mm -hmm. Leadership comes in many forms. And uh, ideally, it comes in a free society with an election. And everybody's inspired, and the new leader says, guys, let's get together, and girls, and let's build a bridge to the future. Suppose Lee Kuan Yew had been termed out after uh, eight years. Yeah, a long time, yeah. I mean, uh, he, was, he was in office for decades. Yeah. He and, was. and you're talking about these things that take decades. And I know some mayors that have turned cities around, like Charleston. They were there for decades. So his term limits sort of go against what you're talking about? I think so. I'm not happy with term limits. Uh, uh, it makes it far easier for the special interest to manipulate a person who's only going to be in office four years. Hmm. And the person gets on a water committee and all of a sudden the lobbyist comes in and has been there for 20 years and he said, son, I can give you all the information you're gonna need. You know, we'll just do this thing right. And that's what happens. And the lobbyist is there for 24 years and he come in with a new election and a new guy on the committee and he keeps doing this. And uh, the system gets worse. Okay, so we're gonna see a, a playoff. I mean, the, the major sort of climate impact besides ours, which is huge, is coming from China increasingly and from India increasingly. And China is aware of Singapore and uh, <laughs> in, in many important ways. And India is a somewhat chaotic democracy, but has uh, also got a lot of things going for it. How do those two play out over 20 years? Um, it's a lot to worry about. Last year, I, was, I chaired a United Nations environmental conference in Beijing. Hmm. And uh, on my panel was the Minister of Environment and Population for the nation of China. And there was another member was uh, from the Indian Parliament hmm. and uh, got one of the Gandhi family and some others. And we had a great afternoon and I said to the Chinese fellow, um, I understand that you have taken one third of your agricultural lands out of production. I think that's kind of stupid. For, sure. That was for cities and expansion or what? So they could build more factories, would create more jobs okay. to manufacture more gadgets. Mm -hmm. And uh, India had done the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, geez, you know, you guys have a history of, of trauma when you have droughts. And the, Go the Gobi Desert is only a couple hundred miles from Beijing. And right now, in winter, so much dust blows off it that in downtown Tokyo or in Korean cities, you can't see. People have to wear masks coming off the growing deserts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, do you think that's pretty stupid? He said, yeah. But he said, the forces for the econo economics are so powerful in this country that I have very little impact trying to do things right. But he said, I'll tell you one thing. I've closed down 17 factories in the last six weeks because they were violating our pollution laws. Mm -hmm. And they're shut down, I want to tell you. He said, I understand in your country, if you even try to shut down a factory, they'll just hire attorneys and keep right on going. Is that right? And I had to laugh and say yes. Now, India loves to shut down factories. They just shut down the Tata cheapest car in the world factory. Yeah, I saw that. And I, I heard him discuss that. The, uh, in India, the same problem occurs. They uh, have uh, the subsistence level living in the villages has been successful. But they had to use a bucket and a rope to get their water out of the village well. All of a sudden now they can afford electric pumps. And so... And they got some subsidies for those pumps, yep, as I remember. Right, right. government yeah. usually does that. <laughs> the worst thing government can do is give subsidies, but it, it did that. So now the larger landowners are happily pumping water with electric pumps, and the water tables of India are sinking. Mm -hmm. And the same damn thing is going to occur with a bad drought. And uh, this, the, the Gandhi from India was telling that story, and she said it is a dangerous, tragic condition. So this glowing economic machine, both China and India, 
has a tough deal with nature, and sooner or later the cards are going to be played, I think. Well, you got a double whammy in both of them, because a whole lot of China, a whole lot of India rely on their water coming from the snows and glaciers in the Himalayas. And yeah. Those are uh, drying up. And so those rivers uh, that they got used to, it's the same as losing the snowpack here in California, only on a humongous yeah. scale. So the combination of already taking the, the aquifers down and having less water coming from the mountains. I like think, Stuart, you ought to do this. Mm -hmm. You should sponsor a conference and bring over representatives of four industrial mites that are in the same tragic condition California is in as regards water and drought. China, India, Australia, and sit down with California and the head of the Africa. federal government Africa and talk about what we need to do. Whatever one of us does, we all should do in the way of improved management. Australians' wheat crop failed last year. Mm -hmm. The Murray River, home of the platypus, and so on. This is a very serious time and a very serious condition in the world, and we naively fiddle along for a year debating some of our political points nonsensically, in my view, instead of dealing with it. Well, it's interesting because California, <clears throat> Steinbeck wrote about it, has this cycle of dry years and wet years. And yeah. you know, the, the memory is never quite long enough during the wet years to remember <laughs> that the dry years are going to come again. We're but one of the situations flawed. we're looking at with climate change is dry years that don't go away. Yeah. And those are the civilization killers. So you yep. can get knocked down and get knocked down a few times, and then if the water doesn't come back, you don't get up. Trees all die, and you're in trouble. On that happy note, let's call it an evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you.